Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, minimum number of moves to seat everyone. So kind of an interesting problem description, but the concept is pretty simple. So we're given a array of seat locations. So we assume that it's kind of a one dimensional grid. Well, I don't even know if you'd call it a grid, but it's one dimensional space. Like the seat is at position one, this seat is at position three, and then this seat is at position five. And so we're given some student positions as well. So student two, or this student is at position two. So over here, student four is at this position. And then somebody is at position seven, which I'm gonna call over here. So the idea is that we wanna move every single student into a seat. And we want to know what is the total minimum distance we would have to move every student. So like this student here would have to move a distance of one to be over here. This student would also move a distance of one. This student would move a distance of two. So the minimum that we'd have to do is a total distance of four. That is the result in this problem. So how do you think we should do it? Well, if you look at this drawing that I did, it took me about 10 seconds to make it and you kind of look at the inputs, you'll see, well, the inputs aren't given in sorted order. But you tell me, does it really make any sense for us to assign this student over here? It really doesn't. Why would we do that when there's a student that's even closer to that position? Okay, so how do we find the closest position for every single student? That doesn't seem trivial. Like maybe we'd have to, for this student, look at every single seat. How do we do that? Well, there are exactly n students and there's exactly n seats. I kind of used the backwards for that, sorry, but you get the idea, right? There's a one for one mapping. So in a sense, we can kind of be greedy, like for every single seat, you can think about it in terms of seats or students, this seat, should probably get the closest student. Doesn't make any sense to look at these two students, just give me the closest student. Same thing with this seat, just give me the closest remaining student, right? Because we already used that student, now give me the closest remaining student. Same thing with this one. The idea is that if we can sort the seats and sort the students, we will have the one-to-one -one mapping because we'll just iterate through both of them at the exact same time. So if I take these two input arrays, and then I sort both of them, I'm gonna get a one, three, five as the first array, and I'm gonna get two, four, seven as the second array, and then I just look at every pair and calculate the diff. So that's a diff of one, this is a diff of one, and this is a diff of two. When I say diff, we probably wanna take the absolute value because it doesn't matter if we move a student this way or that way, the distance is always gonna be considered positive. So that's the idea behind this problem. Now, if we sort both of the inputs, Recognize that since both of them are of length n, it's gonna be an n log n operation each time, and then we iterate through both of them. So obviously this is gonna dominate the time complexity, and we're gonna do that twice, but constants don't really matter. So this is the overall time complexity if we use some kind of built-in sort method. But there is a small optimization I think you can make, and you know, in my opinion, I don't even consider it an optimization, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Take a look at the constraints for this problem. The value for every student and seat, the positions are gonna be between one and 100. So we can do something called count sort, where the time complexity of sorting is gonna be the range of values. Since the range of values is of size 100, we could say that the time complexity is gonna be just the time complexity of iterating over the length of the input plus 100, I guess, but since they're both the same and this is like a very small constant term, we don't really consider that. So that's the time complexity of sorting. And then we will have to iterate over an array of size 100. And I'm gonna show you what counting sort is in a second, but that's gonna be the time complexity, n plus 100. Now, maybe counting sort would make sense if the values were bounded between one and 100, but the length was very, very big. Suppose the length is like a million. In that case, counting sort makes sense because the alternative would be n log n. And by the way, this like big term, this is what n is. So if n was a really, really big term, of course, you don't wanna do n log n, this is better. But in this case, n is bounded to 100. So 
in most cases, end login is not inefficient at all. Like most people don't realize it, but log n grows very slowly. If n is 100, log 100 is I think like six or seven. So you tell me is 700 very inefficient? Not really. And in most cases, n is probably not going to be exactly 100. It might be something like 10. In that case, 10 log 10 is going to be very, very small. I think it might be like 40 or 50. So in most cases, actually, this solution and log n is going to be more efficient than the other one because this one always is going to require us to iterate 100 times. Now, there's a small optimization you can make where instead of doing counting sort with 100, you actually just take the max value from either of the arrays. But even in that case, like what if one of the max values was 100 and then the other one is like one or two, we'd still need that 100. You know, this is just kind of my argument that if in a real interview you whipped out counting sort from a problem like this one where it's really not required, it's probably not going to make anything more efficient. I would just, you know, ask you, why are you using counting sort? I would at least ask you to explain a little bit about the time complexity and hopefully you realize that it's really not making things more efficient in this problem. Okay, with all of that ranting aside, let's actually get into counting sort. And the idea is that if we know that the values are bounded between one and 100, we can create an array of size 100, which is going to like for the indexes from zero through 100, we're gonna have an array for seats and we're gonna have an array for students and we're gonna count the occurrences of each one kind of like a hash map. So for seats, let's say we have a one and then we're gonna put a plus one here for three, we're gonna put a plus one here for five, we're gonna put a plus one here and the rest of them are zeros. Same thing with students, two, we'll put a one here, four, we'll put a one here and for seven, uh, we'll put a one there. So now we can iterate over these and we're gonna fill in zeros for everything else. And now we can iterate over this array of size 100. We don't necessarily know where all of the ones are and like where exactly we counted. That's why for an example like this one where the input sizes are pretty small, counting sort doesn't really make sense because look at it, now we have to iterate over this thing that's of size 100 just to find the values. So the idea is gonna be that we're gonna have two pointers. One is gonna be in the first array, another is gonna be in the second array. We're we're going to keep shifting the pointers until we find a one in both spots. And then we're going to take the difference of the indexes, because remember, this index tells us that we have a seat at index one. This index tells us we have a student at position two. So we take the differences between the positions and add that to our result. This time it's one. Next time our pointer is going to be here and our other pointer is gonna be over here. The difference in distance is one, so we add that to the result. And then in the end, we'll have a seat over here and a student at seven. So we take the difference between five and seven, that's gonna be a plus two. So the total result is gonna be four, same as before. One tiny optimization that I kind of mentioned a second ago is that you technically don't need this to be of size 100 because even though the values in the constraints tell us that the values are gonna be in the range of one through 100, we could actually decrease the second term because we could just take the max of both of these arrays, in this case it's seven, and then recognize that we don't actually need any space beyond that because we're not gonna have any seats or students at a position that's greater than seven. So this will technically save you some space and some time, but again, I personally don't think counting sort is worth it in this problem, but I'm still gonna code it up because I think the other solution was probably more easy to code up. If you can do the counting sort way, you can probably do it the other way as well. So what I'm gonna do is create those two arrays that I was talking about, counting seats and counting students at each position. And to get the size, we could say multiply by 100. I'm actually gonna do 101 because then we don't get the index out of bounds. Like we can map a student at position 100 to index 100, but I'm also gonna do something else. I'm gonna find the max index by just getting the max from seats and by getting the max from students and then taking the max of both of those, kind of what I talked about, just finding the max value. I'm gonna add a plus one to it for reasons I talked about a second ago because we don't wanna get that index out of bounds. So here I'm going to multiply this instead of using 101, I'm gonna use the max index, same thing here. Now let's actually count all the seats, seat in seats, let's just go to count seats. We're gonna map this seat to this count. We're gonna add one to it. Same thing for every single student. So every student in the array of students and increment the count 
of that student at that position. So now we have the counts. Now it's time for that two pointer technique I talked about. So I'm going to have I and J. You could call them something else if you want. One pointer is going to be assigned to seats and one is going to be assigned to students. I'm also going to have our result. This is going to be the count, the number of moves that we have to make. And I'm going to return that. But now for the actual computation, you might not know what condition to put here. I kind of know, but I'll wait until the end before I put it here. But the idea is that we just want to keep shifting the pointer. I'm going to say I is the pointer for seats. We want to keep shifting it while it's not at a student. If the count of this is equal to zero, we want to increment the pointer by one. We want to keep shifting this pointer until we get to an actual seat. Same thing with J. So if count of students for this pointer is equal to zero, we're going to keep shifting the pointer. So we want both of the pointers to be at a seat and at a student. And then if they are, so if this is non-zero and this is non-zero, then we want to take the absolute difference between the two indexes and we want to add that to the result. Also, we want to decrement each of these by one because we are using a seat and we're using a student. So I'm going to decrement this by one. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to decrement that by one as well. Now we could solve this multiple ways. Like for the condition here, we could use I and J, a combination of them. I think it's easier just to count the number of remaining students that we haven't assigned a spot. Initially, I'm going to set that equal to the length of students. While remain is non-zero, we're going to keep doing these operations. Every time we find a student and assign them to a seat, we're going to decrement remain by one. So this is, I think, a very natural and readable way to code this up. So this is what I'm going to do. Let's run it. As you can see, it works and it looks like this time it's actually pretty efficient. The last couple times I ran it, it wasn't, but I do want to code up the actual regular sorting solution as well, just to show you that it's actually probably going to be more efficient in terms of the runtime. So just to prove it, let's run sort on the seats. Let's run sort on the students. Well, I guess we don't need two pointers this time. We can just say for I in range, the length of one of those arrays, I'll take seats. And then we'll have our result here as well. It's going to be zero. We're going to take the difference between seats at this index and students at this index. So the difference between those positions, take the absolute value of that and add that to the result. And we'll see that this is obviously very short. Let's run that. And as you can see, this time it did run actually faster than the other one. I feel like if I ran it a few more times, it would be even more efficient. But that just kind of goes to show you that for this example, counting sort based on the constraints technically does not make sense. So even though the big O runtime of counting sort is more efficient, it's still not practical in my opinion. If you found this helpful, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.